Hi, everybody, and welcome to another Clarion Herald NOLA Catholic Parenting Podcast. I'm Christine Bordelon, Associate Editor of the Clarion Herald. The pandemic has prompted a roller coaster ride of emotions for all of us over the past year, and I hear it's been significantly tough on high school students, especially seniors who have missed out on traditions normally celebrated during senior year. To address what students are experiencing, St. Mary's Dominican, Cabrini High School, Archbishop Chappelle, and Roma collaborated with pediatrician Dr. Brian Credo to produce an informative video, Arrested Development, Raising Healthy Teens in a Time of Pandemic. Dr. Credo is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics and director of the biomedical track in the pre-professional program at Archbishop Rubble. So this morning, Dr. Credo, Dominican's Vice President um, and Principal Karen Favre, and we have parent Michelle Nichols, who's got a student at Rommel and Dominican and Cabrini's principal, Yvonne Ratman, with us. And we're going to discuss this topic about how the pandemic's affecting teens. So good morning, everybody. Yeah, first I'd like to ask Carolyn if, um, you know, we, how did this video come about? And, and tell me a little bit about the timing. I mean, have you noticed more anxiety and depression in students at Dominican? Well, I'll tell you about how the video came about. Actually, it goes all the way back to, I think it was November, Yvonne and I were attending a, um, a Catholic school's principal meeting. And after the meeting, we sort of had a side or a conversation. And I, I guess we were lamenting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just talking about the students and the parents and the faculty, how down everybody was and whatever the decisions the schools were making, it, it seemed like we couldn't make everybody happy. And so after some discussion, we realized we were experiencing the same problems. And uh, what I didn't know at the same time, Dr. Thomas, Cynthia Thomas, was having conversations with Dr. Credo uh, and looking at possibly having him come speak to our parents. And so when I got back to school and I spoke to Dr. Thomas about my conversation with Yvonne, she said, well, you know, I'm having this conversation with Dr. Credo and perhaps we could have him come speak to Dominican parents. And after a little bit more conversation, we said, well, why not invite, since Yvonne and I had the conversation previously, let's make a, do a collaborative effort and invite, invite Cabrini and see if they would want to, you know, come together with us. And um, then when we went back to Dr. Credo, he thought it was a wonderful idea to collaborate with some schools. And certainly he would represent Rummel since he works very closely with Rummel. And it just started evolving. And then he said, oh, I have some great notes I could share. And then I spoke to Yvonne again, and we said, we, we need to do this right away because we just felt that the urgency to have a presentation. So that's how it all got started. And um, it took off from there and very successfully. Right, well, I know it's a wonderful video when I, when I looked at it. And Yvonne, you know, I had just heard that, um, that one of the students at one of our local high schools just committed suicide. So, you know, I wondered, you know, if you are noticing, you know, just different depression, anxiety, just kids feeling different at school, a different mood than before the pandemic. Oh, definitely. Um, our, you know, uh, just a week prior to our conversation with Carolyn at our CSPA meeting, my guidance staff had asked to meet with me. And at that time they expressed a concern about the level of depression and anxiety of our students. Um, and we had been in a hybrid model where some students were on virtual, some were in school, and some were in and out. Uh, and certainly none of the social activities were going on. And at the same time, you know, from hearing from our teachers that our students were, many of our students seemed more disengaged than ever. Um, you know, the challenge of connecting with students on virtual was, was so difficult. Um, there was, appeared to be a greater lack of motivation to follow through on the student's behalf. So, so you know, the counselors who rarely come to me with this great a concern, I really sensed it in that conversation with them. And that led up to the conversation Caroline just, ex Caroline just explained. Um, and, you know, I think as we've approached the spring and the vaccines have come out, there's a little more optimism and hope. Um, we are, are trying to plan some of the end of the year activities, of course, very much innovatively designed, you know, within safe, um, <laughs> safe guidelines. Um, but yes, I think um, the length of time, 
you know, the development that Dr. Credo explained that would be typical for an adolescent, all that's been impacted. Um, and we do, we have seen an increase in depression and anxiety in our student population. Well, Colin, I know you were saying that you and Yvonne were talking about, you know, the, what your experience with your students. So how important do you think it was to reach out to even further, you know, beyond just your two schools? Because I know Dr. Credo, you know, works with Rommel students. Um, so, you know, what was the impetus there to, to reach out further? Well, um, you know, the high schools are so competitive, <laughs> you know, and we thought, like in my conversation with Dr. Thomas and and we thought, well, and because of my prior conversation with Yvonne, you know, the two schools, Cabrini and Dominican, and we, we both agree that if we're experiencing these problems, everybody's got to be experiencing the same thing, we thought. And so wouldn't it be nice to have a collaborative effort, you know, where the high schools could come together and not on a, a competitive basis but a more of a collaborative effort and really touch upon a topic that was so prevalent. And I think Yvonne touched on it when she said, you know, it was just kind of for the student, a lack of hope. Um, they were very, I can say for us, and I did speak to our counseling department and wasn't so much a depression, although you know, we do have students uh, who have a propensity and, and certainly in those cases it was uh, exacerbated, but it was more of a restlessness, a disconnect, not motivated, um, kind of disgruntledness, and um, because they believed that everything was been taken away, and I think that was a hard, that was a hurdle to uh, jump over. That uh, you know that on the day of registration, because it took five days to register this year as opposed to one because of the, the numbers um, and the protocols. That I I said to every student that day, let's concentrate on what we can do instead of what we can't do. But I think that got kind of lost. <laughs> so, but I think that to go back to your initial question, it was, you know, let's do something collaborative for the good of all. Sure. Mm -hmm. Dr. Credo, I definitely wanted to get you in this conversation. Yeah, sure, sure. Like in, in your, your practice and teaching at Rommel, you know, have you encountered more teens struggling, um, you know, just, or even having, just trouble concentrating. What have, what have you noticed? Well, certainly, if you look across the board, um, uh, national statistic-wise, um, there definitely has been an uptick in teens showing symptoms of depression and things along those lines. Um, for example, if you compare the number of emergency room visits for adolescents um, during the pandemic era compared to like 2018, there has been a marked increase in the number of emergency room visits for teens seeking help with mental health issues, not just emergency room visits for accidents or skateboard injuries or the normal stuff, mm. but for teens actually uh, seeking help for things that they otherwise in past times hadn't really uh, often sought help for. Um, so there's been an increase there. There's also been an increase, sadly, in the number of opioid deaths and the number of overdose deaths and things. Now that goes skews a little more towards the young, adole young adult adolescent perspective, but uh, Louisiana especially, um, sadly to say, has had a marked increase in, in those types of situations. So across the board nationally, we def I think most doctors would tell you that they have seen uh, in their practices and in their, if they, especially if they work in emergency rooms, um, they have definitely seen an increase since the pandemic. And that's not really surprising. You have uh, teens under such stress. And um, it's not just the stress of the pandemic itself and the worry about um, your health and the worry about your parents' health and all of those things. But there are so many other pandemic-related issues which are impacting teens. For example, um, parents have lost jobs. Um, many parents are kind of not in the situation they were two years ago. And that uh, teens notice that. Teens know what's going on in the family. Teens know when mom or dad are under the gun, under stress a little bit. Um, you have that situation. You have the situations of being isolated. Uh, you know, in our little video in December, which I was so honored to do with these wonderful schools, um, you know, we talked about the fact that, you know, teens learn by engaging with their peers. And all of a sudden that kind of went out the window. You couldn't engage with your peers in the way you normally did. Uh, senior prom, looking forward to everything. Uh, sorry, no senior prom. Uh, ring dance, looking forward to it. It's finally my year, ring dance. Sorry, no ring dance. Um, you know, it really was a tough situation in many ways for them. And many of them adapted beautifully well. We have wonderful teens in our schools and, and they did, they, many of them are very, very resilient and wonderful kids, but it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge for many of them. 
Well, it sounds like it's really a timely topic. And I know there's so much information out there. So I wanted to ask you, how did you decide like what to include in the video when you were talking? Because I mean, I just got an email today from the Institute for Family Studies talking about youth anxiety. And so where did you grab your information and, you know, what points did you decide were very important for parents to, you know, to learn from? Sure. Well, there's a wonderful series called um, uh, uh, Raising Teens uh, that's put out by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And in the video, we refer to that and we talk, they kind of break down parenting into a few basic areas and they kind of just try to give parents the basic nuts and bolts of how to oversee your team, but not be too smothering of how to set limits, but give a little flexibility in the limits. So it's a nice little series. And I thought that would be helpful during this time. And um, I must say too, I was just so excited to work with Principal Rabin and Principal Favre and, and uh, Rommel Chappelle, all the schools which came together, because I totally agree with Ms. Favre. We tend to get in our silos in Catholic education sometimes, and we are a bit competitive from time to time. And, and so it was just so wonderful to see all these schools, boys schools and girls schools, and everybody kind of coming together to kind of just put the kids first. It's not about your school. It's not about your reputation. It's not about who gets this many kids or who gets that many. It's about the kids. And it's just about putting them first. And when we do that in Catholic education, uh, nobody can beat us. We can't be stopped. I mean, we, we are uh, an incredible force when we harness all of those issues together. So that to me was one of the nicest parts about it was to see the schools all come together and work together in a, uh, you know, in a collegial way. And I really like that aspect of it very much. Well, I know you mentioned in the video that parents don't realize the power that they actually have, you know, when raising their kids. And you believe that teens, and you kind of mentioned this already, are listening to what parents are saying. And, you know, so parents need to be a better example. But I know you mentioned five tips from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Raising Teens Project. So you can, can you quickly go over some of those tips that you mentioned in the video? Sure. Well, some of them just had to do with the setting of limits, how you want to um, set limits, but not be too overbearing. And there were different ones. If you go back and look at the video, which I'm sure we're going to have a way for people to do later, um, you can look at all the five. But basically, they talked about role uh, setting of limits, about connecting with your teens, about understanding that your teens are listening. You know, it's funny. During my practice, I would, uh, you know, for, on so many occasions, you have a teen come in. And, and the parent, and the parent tells you, you know, Doc, he doesn't listen to a word I say. He doesn't listen to a word I say. I try till I'm blue in the face and he doesn't listen. And then I'll have the parent step out for a minute so I can talk one-on-one -on -one with the teen. Let me tell you, the teen can tell you everything <laughs> that dad says. The teen can tell you everything that the parent says. The teens are listening. They don't always want you to know they're listening, but the teens are listening. So I thought that was really kind of an important part to drive home. Sometimes parents get, get a little hopeless and they think they really can't control anything and they can control a great deal. You know, in the video, I mentioned that James Baldwin, who was a great American writer, once said that um, children have never been very good at listening to their parents, but they have never failed to imitate them. And oh. I, that, that, that's one of my favorite quotes. I'll say it one more time. Children have never been very good at listening to their parents, but they've never failed to imitate them. So if mom and dad are not just talking the talk, but they're walking the walk, and if the teen can see that, that they're struggling and they're trying, but then that teen's gonna be empathetic towards them and want to kind of be part of that healing process in nine times out of 10. So um, parents do have a great more sway with their teens than they understand. And a lot of it has to do with your own example, setting your own example of a parent as to what is proper behavior, what is moral behavior, what are things that are actually the right way to approach a situation, even when you're under stress, there's a right way and a wrong way to approach a situation. And if parents model that, then the teens are picking up on that. And it's really hard for parents who don't model that or who kind of tend to sometimes put themselves first a little bit, then it's hard for them to connect with the teen and expect the teen to do things in a way that they themselves won't do it. So I'm a big believer in parental uh, <laughs> help and modeling there. Sure. Well, Michelle, you're in the trenches. We have, <laughs> yeah. um, you have a daughter at Dominican and a son at Rummel, is that right? That's right. What grade? Uh, in and have you seen any changes or noticed anything differently about their behavior since all this pandemic started? Yes, um, they. My daughter is a junior at Dominican, and my son is a junior at Rummel. Oh, they're, um, they're not. They're oh. not twins. Okay. However, yes, they're in the same grade, and um, it's been difficult for them. Um, I'll say. We definitely like the model that the school started with this year, as opposed to what we had to do in the fourth quarter. 
you know, in the fourth quarter, you know, obviously that was like a strange situation and schools were just like, you know, trying to do the best they could on no notice you know, to finish the year and they did a great job. Um, my daughter didn't do well with how we had to do things. You know, she's not a self-starter. She needs a classroom. So um, this year, starting with hybrid, Rummel and Dominican did the same model, I believe was um, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They'd be in person, Tuesday, Thursday, they'd be online. And then the next week it would like flip flop. And um, that worked great. Um, it was real time class. They were actually, logging into the classes at the actual time of the class, you know, and so that went really well. Um, but right, as I think someone mentioned, time wearing on, you know, things like that, I started to see them uh, just with, there were, it was boredom, not that they didn't have enough to do, they had plenty work to do, but just kind of like a, ugh, like a, a funk, you know, and it's not being able to connect. A loss of interaction, huh? Is that, that probably contributed a lot to it. Right. Just lack of interaction, um, normal things they would be able to do, they couldn't do. And I think, um, you know, the, just, it was just stressful. It was stressful and everybody having to do things way differently than they did before, you know, um, it's just out of necessity, the things we've had to do. Um, but I, I mean, I want to say kudos to the schools because they've had a really hard job and they've done a fantastic job with doing what they had to do and trying to make it somewhat more for kids. And uh, yeah, I appreciate, you know, Rummel, Dominican, which I can speak about with experience because my kids are there. Um, well, yeah. Carolyn, I wanted to ask you and Yvonne too, I mean, you know, since especially the seniors are missing out on some of the things, or, or maybe you guys have done different things to compensate for what they're missing. So could you tell me maybe some of the things that normally would have been held, you know, like Dr. Frito was saying, ring mass or ring, uh, ring dance um, or senior prom in the, in, I guess you don't even know yet if y'all can have senior prom, but what have y'all done at both your schools? Carolyn, you tell me first. Well, what we've tried, attempted to do, uh, we did have ring day. They did receive their rings um, on the uh, scheduled day. The, the only thing that was missing and was ring dance because we couldn't make that happen. Um, we've tried, uh, just recently we um, had our rally day, which is an authentic Dominican tradition. And we're getting ready in a modified version, but we were able to pull it off. And I think the students were very, very happy that we did. Um, and like I said, it looked very different than, than it usually uh, that has been in the past, but we did pull it off. We're getting ready for induction. Now, usually induction <laughs> involves the seniors with their little sisters. And this usually occurs in uh, September. So uh, we're going to have, we scheduled that for March, um, but it will happen again in a very modified version. So we're trying to keep as much on the calendar, maybe postponed, not completely canceled, but postponing events. And as numbers improve, um, you know, we'll do the best we can. So everything's been in a modified version. And of course that takes a lot of planning. And uh, when you're moving people around and trying to make it all as safe as possible. So. Yvonne, is it similar at Cabrini too, which y'all done? Yes, the fall, um, we kept a tighter grip um, on all the protocols, not that we've let up any, but just as we understand them and, and think more creatively, you know, we did have a ring ceremony and a mass with only parents in attendance with our student population. Um, but we've been trying to creatively have other activities. We just had Student Council Spirit Week right before Mardi Gras. And it's it's basically they dress up in a different theme each day. Um, and that brings an energy. Um, I think when we closed down our virtual option at the end of January and, and everybody, except those who were quarantined, um, returned to campus, there was just a whole new life on campus. Um, you know, we've, we've reinstituted just some typical things. We have birthday with the principal monthly, and it was a pizza party and cupcakes, well, we revised it. Like Carolyn said, you know, you have to think creatively. How can you still do something, get the celebration in, but stay safe? Um, we have, the seniors have a 
a lunch with the president every year where there's a group of 10 or 12. And this year it's, it was, you know, held, you know, smaller groups, uh, pre-packaged -pre lunches and, um, and they really enjoyed the opportunity a little bit shorter period of time. Um, we're looking ahead to, we won't have a prom or dance because that's not in the allowable guidelines, but we're, we're in the midst of planning what we call a senior, we'll call a senior celebration um, and probably something similar for juniors. Um, and, and we're trying to get the student's voice on, since you're not having a prom or a dance, what's, what's most important to you? Is it, is it dressing up? Do you want to wear a prom dress to an activity that's not a dance? Um, <laughs> is it being with your sisters, you know, or being with a date? Or, you know, so, so what, what's important to you to feel like, you know, you've been heard, you can own the event. So it's not like a top-down decision because we're certainly not as creative as putting a group of girls in a room. <laughs> um, so trying to balance that social opportunity um, at, at the same time, the concern for balance and safety for kids, but also for the chaperones, you know, when you're putting teachers in the position to monitor events for the students, um, you have to keep, keep in mind, you know, both groups. Right. Well, Dr. Creed, I want to go back to you at this point, because I know you, you mentioned a little bit about increases, like in emergency room visits, maybe of potential suicides or threats or whatever. So, you know, in the video, I know you, you stress to parents to never ignore if they hear their child talk about, you know, thoughts of suicide. You said to seek mental attention immediately like they were a counselor. So how long is too long for a parent to, to wait after they hear such a thought maybe from their child or their child's friend saying, hey, you know, so-and-so said they're, they're thinking about committing suicide, you know, so what's, what's the time frame a parent should act? Right, so this is kind of a challenging area because it requires discernment on the part of the parents. I, I don't have a set mathematical number that I can give you that works for every kid in America the same way. So I can't say wait 3.4 hours and it doesn't work like that, sadly. But what I can do is tell you that certainly if the threat seems uh, out of bounds or, or very loud or very dangerously sounding, people questioning about how many people will come to their funeral or very definitive, then you need to kind of jump on that right away and make sure the kid that your, your, your young person has some uh, person to talk to and some way to evaluate that and some way to find out with a mental health professional or, or someone else to, how to go about getting steps so that kind of thinking um, can be addressed. So um, roughly, if you look at the national guidelines, it, it, it's kind of hard to tell, but like the University of Chicago, the University of Chicago Medical School has some uh, suggestions they give where they say that if you have the following symptoms um, like that last for more than two weeks, that these are things that really become concerning. So if there's poor performance in school, if there's sadness or help, hopelessness, if there's um, irritability, anger, hostility, frequent or, or tearfulness or frequent crying or things like that, um, they withdraw from friends, have loss of interest in their activities, loss, a lack of enthusiasm, changes in eating, sleeping, restlessness, all these are kind of vague things, but if you see this kind of pattern emerging, then it's better to, to act earlier and to kind of get on that once you see that beginning to start emerging. Um, all teenager, teenagers have a bad day once in a while, just like all adults do. So if the teenager once in a while curses or does this or has a bad day, that you don't have to instantly uh, rush them to the local emergency room, but you have to discern as a parent. You know your child, you know what your child is normally like, and if in your discernment you feel that there's something out of the ordinary or there's something that really is concerning to you, then we just like for parents to get help sooner rather than later because we want to be as safe as possible. And we want to make sure that the young people are protected as much as possible. So um, it, it's a challenge. It's a little bit of a challenging situation, but certainly if things kind of, you know, get out of whack in that regard, you want to kind of not just chalk it up to teenage melodrama and just go about your business because then sometimes when people do that, tragic things can happen. So you wanna know your child, you wanna to talk to them about it, you wanna kind of understand them and kind of go through things with them and let them know that you don't have all the answers because we don't. Be honest with them, be open with them. But uh, just that fact of engaging with them is so important uh, because they are in need of connection, especially right now during the pandemic. They are in need of connection from people. So there's all kinds of things you can suggest too for furthering mental health. Um, keeping them in touch with their friends via phone calls, via Zoom chats, via a lot of different things. Having them call family members they wouldn't normally call. Aunt so-and-so lives in uh, Oklahoma and she would love to get a call once in a while from her niece or her nephew who lives in Louisiana. 
you know, things that they wouldn't normally do, but that still connect them with family and where they came from and who people who care about them. Um, going outside with the family and kicking a soccer ball around with the family. Just outside and uh, things like exercise elevate their moods. They release endorphins in the brain. They elevate the mood of the teen. All the, there's a lot of things you can do, but um, there's no set numerical answer to how long is too long. But you want to really know your, your child and you want to ask. And even sometimes if you get rebuffed, welcome to the world of being a parent. You're going to get rebuffed sometimes. We all do. But okay. even if you get rebuffed, you, you have to kind of try and hang in there and try to find out what's troubling you and going on from there. And one of the other things you had mentioned is to not, the teens themselves shouldn't demand so much from themselves. You know, it's not always the parents demanding. Sometimes the kids are so motivated, right. they want to do their best and they just feel overwhelmed because everything's so changed and, and they don't know where to turn. So, and, but I wanted you to also tell me, you know, what can parents do without, like you said, hovering over them to, to notice some of the changes that are, that are going on in, in, in the behavior of their children, you know, without being. So, sure. Without hanging on over. Right? Exactly. So when your children were little and they were eight years old and nine years old, I have only sons. So I can only <laughs> speak from that perspective. But when my sons were little, there were Cub Scout meetings and there were things that we did and camp outs and things. And at the Cub Scout meetings, you have Cub Scout dads and I was a Cub Scout dad and you, and you kind of with them all the time and you're seeing what's happening and you're doing everything. In teenagers, it doesn't really work that way. But that doesn't mean you totally withdraw from observing them. You have to maybe set up networks a different way. You have to talk to other parents. And you have to let other parents kind of tell you what's going on at this situation, what's going on there. You have to talk to school counselors. You have to talk to school personnel. There are all kinds of people who are in your teenager's life. And they can often be great sources of help and information. So the teen doesn't feel like dad is always on his shoulder, but rather you still understand what's going on with them, but you do it from a, in a different way than you did when they were eight years old at the Cub Scout meeting. So you have to kind of develop a network. You have to kind of work with other parents. You have to work with uh, school counselors. School counselors, amen, kudos to school counselors because they are so vital in this entire process. They play such a great role. And oftentimes teens will go to them first before they'll even go to members of their family. So our counselors deserve way more money than they get. <laughs> I'll just tell you that they, they are incredible people. They really are uh, top notch. So you have to develop that network. And that's one way that parents can still be involved, but not hovering. So if your teen's going to some event, and well, nowadays the events are pretty much curtailed, but in normal times, you would talk to the parents who are hosting that event. You would find out what's going on there. You would, you would kind of know ahead of time what type of event it is. You don't just want to step totally to the back and let the teens do whatever they feel like doing at whatever time, because that can sometimes be a recipe for disaster. So you have to be involved. You just can't be the hovering vulture. That's <laughs> well, Michelle, I mean, I just wondered, you know, when you saw the video, did you find anything that you could use differently than what you were doing with your kids to help them out? I thought it was a really good reminder of um, what we should already be doing and just even more so now. Dr. Credo pointed out that, uh, you know, I think we already said it, that during these years, they're normally um, developing through their social interactions and there's different opportunities by going to football games or whatever the case is that they might not have right now. And that affects them. Um, to us, it's just like, uh, you know, like as an adult, maybe we don't really realize how important that is, but that's like their world and their friends and their peers have a really big influence um, on them. And so it's important for them to still have opportunities to be around people their age. Um, for us, it's been important to keep our kids in church and our youth group still meets. So, you know, they go to that and that's been a lifeline for them, um, continuing to, you know, um, just as a family, you know, pray at home and encourage, you know, the kids faith because really Jesus is the answer to everything. And so for them to continue to look up, look outside of themselves, like it's, you know, because if they just stay like right here in their own little sphere, it can get really depressing and um, they could feel hopeless, but um, to continue pointing them to the Lord and um, his hope, his truth. Um, I just, I loved everything Dr. Credo said in that video. It just, I mean, it just, and his care for the kids, for the boys really comes through. And I told my son that after mm -hmm. I watched the video, I said, you know, Andrew said, um, Dr. Credo really cares about you guys. He goes, yeah, he does. <laughs> so, um, you know, they see it. And 
Her Very son's sad. one of my favorites. He's, he's one of the best. I don't have to, he, he's a fine young man. So tell him thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I appreciate it. All you guys collaborating. Like I, it encouraged me as a parent to see, like when I saw the thing advertised, I'm like, oh, wow. Look at these various schools, like doing this together. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, it was, it was encouraging. I think we need more of that. I really do. I mean, I, if I may just chime in at the end, I really do. I think we need more of that. We need to keep our family of Catholic schools in a cooperative mode. I, I think yeah. we can't be stopped if that happens. Right. And I think it shows that all of you administrators really care about your students. Like that's what came through to me was, wow, you know, this isn't something normal, but they see the need. And so they're doing something about it. And that really touched my heart as a parent. And I'm glad Michelle mentioned this because we all represent Catholic schools. And I think the, the important thing is the, the importance of prayer uh, in, the, in the students' lives. And that, you know, we try to teach them that you can pray about anything and always. And I think as we're representatives of Catholic school, how important prayer is. And I, I'm so happy that, Michelle, that you mentioned that because, um, you know, we always have who we can point to, you know, and draw strength and, and hope. So I appreciate your comment about the, the prayer in the daily life of the student. All right. Well, this has been very helpful, I think, for a lot of people out there who are struggling with their kids and don't know what to do, what to turn, how to help them. So thank you all for joining us today. I, I really appreciate your time. And so stay tuned for our next NOLA Catholic Parenting Podcast. And in the meantime, you can read NOLA Catholic Parenting columns in the printed Clarion Herald. And you could also find them at Mass and at retail outlets throughout the city. Or you can go online at clarionherald.org or go to our blogs, which sit at nolacatholicparenting.org as well. So thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.